a very warm welcome to Fashion Talks at the American University of Paris to the 2021-22 series entitled Between Consumption, Criticism and Activism. This year's edition is concerned with the different and contradictory roles that we all play in relation to fashion and the fashion industry. And the work of our guest today is therefore really highly pertinent, the fashion educator, activist and educator and scholar Ben Berry is joining us today. Thank you very much, Ben, for joining us from New York today. We are very happy to welcome you to AUP. And please give a warm welcome or as warm a welcome as digital possibly to Ben. Ben Berry is the Dean of Fashion at Parsons School of Design and Principal Investigator of the Cripping Masculinity Project, about which he'll be talking tonight. In his talk, Misfit Masculinity, Self-Fashioning in a Sanest and Ablest World. Ben's teaching and research centers the intersectional fashion experiences of disabled, fat, trans, and queer people and engages them in the design of clothing, media, and fashion systems. Ben has published very widely in journals, including Fashion Theory, Gender and Society, and Fat Studies, and he's the co-editor of Crossing Gender Boundaries, Fashion to Construct, Disrupt, and Transcend, and also the forthcoming book, Fashion Education, The Systemic Revolution. In 2021, Ben published an important text entitled How to Transform Fashion Education and Manifesto for Equity, Inclusion and Decolonization in the International Journal of Fashion Studies that I highly recommend and that we, a group of students and my colleague Sophie Courbjian, um, read together here at AUP with students. In his work, Ben is devoted to mobilizing justice in fashion education. So a very warm welcome to you and um, over to you, Ben. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon from New York. I'm excited to be with you. Today, I'm gonna to talk specifically around one of my current projects, Cripping Masculinity. But as we open up the conversation afterwards, I'm certainly happy to think through connections and other conversations around fashion education as well. I'm gonna begin by sharing my screen. Not there, there we go, perfect. So I wanna to start today by asking us to consider a question. How is fashion research storied to marginalized people? And particularly, how is it storied people whose embodied differences disrupt dominant ideas and dominant ideals about gender, about identity, and about the fashionable body. And I'm speaking here specifically about trans people, non-binary people, fat people, racialized people. And in the context of this research, these intersections with disabled, deaf, and mad identified people. Often this research in fashion tells us a single story. And this is a story of how marginalized people are oppressed because they're restricted by the dominant fashion system and by society at large. And as a result, they experience social and economic disadvantage. Now, I certainly don't deny this oppression, but I know that the story is broader than this single narrative tells us. Today, I'm gonna to explore with you how closing off access to dominant systems opens up access to creativity, vitality, and imagination. Today, I'm gonna to explore how closing off access to dominant systems opens up an antidote to toxic masculinity and the ways in which it's intertwined with ableism and sanism. And today, I'm gonna to explore how closing off access to dominant systems particularly amplifies openings for people who are multiply marginalized by their layered identities. I'm gonna be sharing research from my five-year project, Cripping Masculinity, which is funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Cripping Masculinity explores how disabled, deaf, and man-identified men 
and masculine non-binary people navigate the world and create new worlds through fashion. And this research specifically looks at the relationship between masculinity, disability, and fashion. Our participants in this project take part in wardrobe interviews about their clothing, workshops where they make outfits to offer access for their bodies and minds, and fashion shows and exhibitions to expand understandings about the deaf, mad, and disability experience. Now, I wanna begin by saying this project proudly uses the words crip and mad. We follow the work of disability justice activists and anti-psychiatry movements that have reclaimed language that has been used to oppress as a radical political act. Crip and mad are said with pride as affirmations of disability and neurodivergence. And it's with this same intention. And I wanna begin now by working to locate myself because before I, wait, look, there we go. Before I continue, I want to actually just acknowledge the land on which the Cripping Masculinity team works and lives, which is the ancestral land of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas, the Cree, the Blackfoot, the Métis, the Iroquois, Denis, Ojibwe, Inuit, and the Lenape people. And acknowledging the rightful custodians of the land is central to the Cripping Masculinity Research Project because this work seeks to center ways of knowing that has existed on this land since time immemorial. Settler colonization and the transatlantic slave trade established a narrow understanding about disability, madness, and this legacy continues to dominate today. It developed a hierarchical system that placed value on people's minds and bodies based on constructed ideas of normalcy, intelligence, and productivity in order to dominate and control. However, indigenous knowledges on this land offer very different worldviews. In many pre-colonial societies, being disabled and mad wasn't associated with shame, exile, or death. During a conversation about understandings of disability, Anishinaabe elder Mona Stonefish shared with me, in indigenous societies, we do not see people for what they lack we see people for what they have. Mona tells us that all bodies and minds offer an important contribution. And this provides a shift from dominant perspectives in which some bodies and minds are deemed worthy and deemed worthy at the expense of others. I now wanna begin by locating myself. As a child, I would spend hours searching for objects in the drawers of my grandmother's kitchen that I could fashion into amazing looks. My favorite looks were made from wrapping myself in plastic wrap to create translucent dresses, or placing a tea cozy on my head to create a voluminous hat. While my family celebrated my creativity, the larger world outside did not. And I quickly developed an understanding of what I could wear and in what contexts through the gatekeeping of stares, slurs, and even a few fists to the face. About five years ago, I was diagnosed with a degenerative visual vision condition. As my vision shifted, my relationship to clothing shifted too, from centering visual appearance to centering the tactile nature of clothing. And these experiences of rejecting dominant masculinity and living with disability opened me up to newfound wisdom and joy and community when I practiced gender and took part in fashion. Yet I'm also a white, thin, cisgender man, and my disability is primarily invisible. My embodied privilege has allowed me to live in the world safely. It's granted me access to fashion. I can easily find clothing that fits my body, buy this clothing, and express my being. But this very intimate experience has led me to conceptualize this research by making me aware of the need to explore this intersection of masculinity, disability, and fashion. And it's reminded me to use my privilege to center communities who are at these intersections, but do not share my immense advantage. Now, when we think about 
disability and masculinity. These two concepts have been constructed in opposition in Western society. We can understand hegemonic masculinity as the most dominant, the most idealized form of masculinity. And in the West, this works to legitimize patriarchy, hierarchy, dominance, and control. And this dominant masculinity has been idealized through a series of gender binaries, strong, not weak, active, not passive, subjects, not objects. And in direct contrast, disability has been associated with the other side of this binary, vulnerability, passivity, and helplessness. It's the same side of the gender binary associated with femininity. Disability can therefore be seen as, re as representing all of the ideas that are expelled from dominant masculinity. Moreover, if we think of madness, madness has been associated with irrational irrationality and unpredictability, whereas masculinity has been grounded in logic and control. And so this assumed conflict this assumed tension between masculinity and disability is what researchers have called the dilemma of disabled masculinity. And in this vein, scholars have concluded that disabled men are committed to hegemonic masculinity. Rather than challenging its ideals, they seek to reclaim them. I now want to introduce crip theory to challenge this narrative of disability as marginalized and specifically as marginalized for masculinity. Crip theory opens up with desire, the ways in which disability and neurodivergence disrupt normalcy. Crip represents creative and generative ways of being in the world, while also recognizing that this wisdom and brilliance are developed from living in an ableist and sanest society. Researchers have assumed that disabled, deaf, and mad people need to negotiate masculinity because disability and madness undoes their masculine practices. Yet if we think through crypt theory and we apply that to hegemonic masculinity, it exposes how able-bodiedness and able-mindedness construct the masculine norm. Crypt theory can be seen as opening up a crack in hegemonic masculinity because disabled people often operate outside of this dominant framework. And so they formulate alternative perspectives. And I think of this even more expansively because as we explore disabled masculinity, especially beyond white, straight, cisgender men with spinal cord injuries, these are the positionalities that have primarily been explored in research on disability and masculinity. We create even more expansive ideas and openings of what disabled masculinity can mean. Now I understand disabled people's disruptions of hegemonic masculinity or dominant masculinity through a disability studies scholar Rosemary Garland Thompson calls misfitting. According to Garland Thompson, misfitting occurs when the environment doesn't sustain the shape and function of the body that enters it. The misfit reveals how disability discrimination is embedded in discourses, in spaces, and in materialities in the world. This can lead to segregation and exclusion, but it can also lead to world-making. Misfitting can generate new perspectives and skills that result from adapting to changing and challenging environments. In this way, misfitting puts embodiment at the center of reimagining masculinity. And of course, as fashion scholars know, embodiment is critical to understanding fashion because dress is a, is a situated bodily practice, as Joanne Andwistle has fam famously written. It connects the intimate experience of the body to wider social norms and standards. And so this practice of misfitting dominant masculinity through fashion, what I'm gonna call today misfit masculinities, can generate new understandings of masculinity itself now, understanding the misfit as an advantage stretches masculinity by centering crip and mad brilliance. And this perspective signals a shift. Most fashion research on disabled, deaf, and mad people has reinforced what indigenous scholar Eve Tuck calls damage-centered research. 
damage-centered research documents pain, loss, and disadvantage in an individual or community. And it does this in order to advocate for political and economic redress. But the consequence is that often these communities become defined by their experiences of oppression. Society thinks of these communities as broken, and this feeling can often become internalized within these communities themselves. Instead, Eve Tuck advocates for desire-based research. This is research that accounts for loss and despair, but also, and at the same time, the hope, the visions, and the wisdom of lived lives and communities. It's important to recognize that desire-based research isn't the opposite of damage-based research. We're not swapping one perspective for another. Rather, desire-based research is a paradigm shift. It recognizes that pain and loss coexist with wisdom and joy. And so today, the stories that I'll share with you primarily come from the first phase of Cripping Masculinity. For this phase, I conducted wardrobe interviews with participants. Now, I did these interviews over Zoom to accommodate health and safety restrictions of the pandemic. And before each interview, participants were asked to select six outfits as noted here on the slide. For this talk, I've selected six participants from the larger sample to discuss. I'm gonna focus on specific encounters between these participants and their clothing. And for each participant, I'm gonna focus on one stage of fashion engagement, acquiring, styling, and wearing. These stories illuminate how disabled, deaf, and mad men and masculine non-binary people occupy and practice what I call misfit masculinities. Misfit masculinities are embodied dress practices that rub up against dominant masculinity. These practices highlight the creativity the disability, deaf, and mad people bring into the world through fashion by stretching masculinity and undoing toxic masculinity. But misfit masculinities are not simply positive and peachy. Doing them is entangled with the experiences of intersecting oppressions and pains. The first story, let's see where, okay. The first story I wanna share with you is from participant MG, who's a 28 year old man identified queer non-binary masculine South Asian and Filipino social worker. For MG, their mad experience has been a benefit in their relationship with clothing because it's allowed them to connect their mind and body. As they explain, I literally ask myself, what color am I today? You know how people are like, how are you doing? I'm like, what color am I feeling today? It's a check-in with myself. I use colors and fashion and shapes and patterns in my clothing to show where my brain and heart is at. MG does not associate particular colors with dominant understandings of gender. As they explain, my masculinity is whatever color I want it to be. Now, MG's developed a communal clothing collective with their social group, a fellow mad, queer, trans, and BIPOC friends. They share clothing with one another. As MG says, as noted here on the slide, we have, a, we have communal clothing. It kind of starts with, hey, can I borrow this thing? I guess it's part of the communal fun now. The fun started with what MG calls the greatest yellow mask, mustard pants I've ever seen in my life. And it's expanded to jackets, sunglasses, rings, bracelets, and t-shirts. The pieces of clothing travel around the city each time their friends get together. But this collective does more than share clothes. They check in on MG's mental health. When MG is disassociating, their friends encourage them to get dressed. Their pals know that when MG wears their favorite clothes, they're literally putting themselves back in their body. MG grew up in a religious family with little exposure to queer and trans people or discussions about mad experiences and mental health. Their friends have helped them ground these conversations and connect to their intersectional identities. 
MG says, the communities before, before meeting queer and trans folk who look like me, there was no acknowledgement of my madness. So having to decompartmentalize all that and recognize the systems and structures that affected my brain and my capacity at the time, it's just super nice now to have humans who understand where I'm coming from when it comes to my madness. The community supported MG to incorporate clothing from their Indian and Filipino culture into their wardrobe. At the time of the interview, they were experimenting with wearing kurtas and barangs. MG's misfit masculinity undoes dominant masculinity by centering interdependence, care, and community. While MG understands madness as an advantage in their fashion practice, they also grapple with, they also grapple with compulsive shopping when they're experiencing manic or depressive episodes. As they explain, when I'm in a depressive episode or when I'm manic, I just buy stuff, especially clothes. I just build this idea in my head of why I need that thing. You just see a mountain of bags of clothes that I haven't opened yet, even though I don't remember what I bought because I was just not with myself. Madness has helped MG develop a relationship with their clothes that challenges dominant masculinity. Yet at the same time, they grapple over compulsive shopping during manic and depressive moments. CX is a 53 year old trans masculine white low income artist who uses a wheelchair. CX previously worked as a photographer but they've been on provincial disability financial support for the last 12 years. For CX, disability has liberated their dress practices from restrictive masculine norms of productivity and financial success. As they explain, I don't need to look like I'm made of money anymore, like I did when I had a job. I felt like I had to perform not just masculinity, but a capitalist look that I'm showing up. I'm here to participate. For CX, disability has opened up their fashion practice to center pleasure in the present moment rather than dominant masculine norms. They fashion outfits that make them feel good in the specific moment. Now CX depends on three clothing networks to acquire clothing because they don't have income to buy new clothes. For example, CX and their partner receive free clothes from friends. As they explain, we're constantly sharing clothes, having a lot of queer and trans friends, friends with disabilities who are going through bodily changes. We have in our kitchen two boxes of clothes that we give away regularly. It's an ongoing process of receiving free clothes, parting with some of it, and keeping some of it. CX's misfit masculinity here is grounded in sharing and mutual aid and compassion. CX also receives free clothing from swaps, but they have to grapple with the ways in which these swaps discriminate against their trans and queer identities or do not provide access for their body as a disabled person. Most clothing swaps that CX attends are run by religious organizations that divide clothes along a narrow gender binary and do not offer a safe space for queer and trans people. As CX explains, some of the only places available to get free clothes are through churches and through religious organizations. And that becomes really hard, really fast. Reflecting on a particular experience, they explain, we were sent to the men's room, even though I really wanted to go and look at the women's fashion. And it was hard. It was like sporty man, ties and suits. That's not it. We don't fit that. CX and their partner also attend an annual queer clothing swap that doesn't separate clothes according to a gender binary. Yet these swaps are held in an inaccessible space and have layouts that do not work for CX as a wheelchair user. When acquiring clothes on a low income, CX therefore grapples with safety as a queer and trans masculine person or having access as a disabled person. Connor is a 30 year old, white, gay, deaf, cisgender man who works in marketing. Connor's deaf experience has taught him to consider the role of clothing in facilitating 
and preventing communication with others. When Connor's meeting with his deaf friends, he'll roll up his sleeves or he won't wear long sleeves at all. This is because he uses his hands and lower arms when signing. And so he needs to keep these parts of his body uncovered. He also picks clothes without bold or loud prints as these would distract when signing. Connor explained during our interview, if you're not familiar with talking about deaf friendly clothes, it's wearing clothes or a tone that's a good contrast. So me as a white person, what I'm wearing now is a good example. One solid color shirt that you can see and identify the finger shapes against a solid background when you're signing to another individual. Connor compares the distraction of wearing a loud shirt when signing to hearing loud noises in, a, in the background when someone is speaking orally. On the surface, it might seem like these plain clothes uphold dominant notions of masculinity, but instead Connor shows us how misfit masculinities are contextual. Connor went to a public school that didn't cater or center deaf students. As a result, he didn't have a lot of connections to deaf community and deaf culture. He only came into deaf community after he finished high school. And it was this experience that helped Connor recognize how his own class privilege was different from many of his deaf peers. As Connor explains, I found that most deaf people are in a situation where they have a lower income. But my parents, both hearing, were fine. They had regular income. And so we had nice clothes, always new. But looking at the deaf community, oftentimes they had older clothes and limited income. That was a new thought for me. Connor discovered how his class privilege created a disconnection between him and his peers in deaf community. Because deaf people are visual, Connor explains that they are especially visually descriptive when they talk about someone, especially if they can't remember their name. The community started to describe him as this new guy who's always dressed up in nice, fancy clothes. Connor decided that he should dress down a bit, wear clothes that were more muted to create a closer relationship in deaf community. And in this context, wearing plain clothes highlights how misfit masculinities prioritize inclusion rather than dominance because the practices center access and relationality. Rather than trying to assert status, Connor changed his clothes to ensure he could engage with deaf community in an accessible way. Yet dressing in deaf friendly clothing causes Connor to grapple with his own intersectional identity because it's, it hides how he would choose to express his queerness. Connor feels joy when he wears bright floral prints and he wears these looks in mainstream queer community. In contrast, he wears plain clothes in deaf community, but he describes these clothes as shapeless and boring. Holding up a vibrantly patterned shirt, Connor explains, I have six different shirts like this. They're all this loud with a print. It's not at all deaf friendly. Holding up a plain gray shirt, he says, I would avoid wearing, I would avoid this when I'm in queer spaces or on a date. It's kind of gray, it's kind of dull, it's kind of shapeless. I would wear something more loud. Connor, Connor, Connor grapples between his deaf and queer identities when he chooses what clothing to wear in what context. Angelo is a 25 year old disabled, trans masculine, queer, fat identified, low income, Chinese Canadian artist. Their disability has given them a deep embodied and spiritual relationship with clothing. Angelo explains, picking out clothing is a spiritual process for me. It's touching the clothing and saying hi to it and being like, do you work? Are you willing to work with me? It's almost like holding hands with someone. I'm holding hands with my disability and of the other hand free. Could I hold the hand of someone who's barking angrily at me? Or could I hold the hand of someone who's very pleasant? 
Angela gives the example of blouse. It doesn't work with their disability if they're using their crutch, but if they're using their cane, it works. In contrast to dominant masculinity, Angelo's experience of disability opens up their relationship to vulnerability, sensitivity, and sensual embodiment. Angelo adores wearing Lolita style dresses because these garments express their understanding of masculinity and feel comfortable on their sensitive skin. Yet Angelo is mindful about when they decide to pick out Lolita style dresses and how they choose to style them. This decision is based on the context in which they'll be in. As a disabled low income person of color, they wear Lolita style dresses in neighborhoods, primarily with other marginalized folks. Angelo explains that they feel safer disrupting masculine norms in these contexts versus in contexts with primarily white and other privileged communities. They explained during our interview. I think when you just do your own thing, people respect that. I think that's the case with communities that have a lot of people of color. Everyone's trying to survive. Everyone's trying to do their own thing. When they see other people doing that, why harass them? Angelo further explains from their experience, white people, they always have a game to pick. They always have questions. They always run up to you. They're like, oh my God, where did you get that from? Can I take a picture? Angelo shares this experience of how spaces inhabited by marginalized communities offer greater respect and understanding because of a shared experience of marginalization. In this way, Angelo's misfit masculinity centers respect and understanding of difference. This is in contrast to hierarchy, uniformity, and violence when faced with difference that's often idealized by hegemonic masculinity. Angelo grapples with finding their place in queer and trans communities because their identities, bodies, and style challenge the standards of these communities. Angelo explained during our interview that mainstream queer and trans communities are very white, very skinny, and very non-disabled. In these communities, masculine folks typically wear masculine styles, such as denim, heavy and rough fabrics, and rugged clothing, especially, according to Angelo, if they're also fat. However, these fabrics are very inaccessible to Angelo as a disabled person. The consequence is that Angelo faces isolation and struggles with not having community, even though they're so proud of who they are. As Angelo explained, me as this fat, queer, Asian, and I'm just generally unhinged. A lot of queer community is like, we don't feel comfortable around you. You're not living up to what queer community should be. But who doesn't want chosen family? Who doesn't want community? And that's the price I pay. I'm a very isolated person. Luke is a 33 year old white, queer, disabled, non-binary person with chronic pain. They previously worked as a lawyer and they were just hired as an assistant for professor of law when we began our interview. Living with chronic pain propelled Luke to wear more skirts. While skirts express their non-binary masculinity, their disability has accelerated their decision to wear more skirts. Luke explains, because skirts are much more comfortable than pants, it makes me much more willing to wear them in public. So that pushes me to act on those things, maybe sooner than otherwise. And to be more daring, because it also has an element that's related to comfort, more than just gender expression. By wearing skirts in academic spaces, especially as they start their new job, they'll challenge traditional notions of masculine dress. However, Luke's confidence to wear skirts at work is new. As a lawyer, they would wear pants to work. Describing these work clothes, Luke explains, I would go to work, come back, and the first thing I would do is proclaim pants are oppression and take off my pants, which marks the moments of freedom from work. That started before my disability, but now it has an added layer that pants are oppressive, even for my own personal well-being. Pants cause Luke deep physical pain. 
They explained that they would come home from work utterly exhausted and feeling horrible. They'd have to take medication, and as they explained, the rest of their day would be ruined. However, they felt pressure to wear pants to fit into traditional masculine professional contexts. So despite Luke's love of skirts and more feminine clothing, they grapple with wearing these looks. As a masculine presenting non-binary person, they're mindful of their own safety as well as of professional consequences. As Luke explained, usually when I wear these kinds of outfits, it's because it's a place where I can be myself without fear of anything happening and just having the freedom to be. Even though I'm sure everyone will be respectful at work, it's also you worry about what people will think and the things they will say about you when you're not there. Luke also thinks about safety when they go out socially with friends. If they go with friends to straight bars, they'll look, as Luke says, much more like a boy. And if they go to more queer spaces, they'll wear skirts and other more traditionally feminine items. As Luke prepares for their new job in academia, they're feeling more confident that they'll wear skirts. Their academic profile says they're non-binary, the hiring committee knew they were non-binary, and their research is related to trans and queer law. Luke hopes that this will help alleviate their concern over what people might say and how they'll be treated should they wear skirts at work. Nevertheless, Luke grapples here with the intersection between disability and gender expression. They balance between comfort, expression, and safety. Sean is a 31-year-old cisgender queer Chinese Canadian curator who works in a disability art gallery and has a physical disability. For Sean, the disability experience has been a provocation to question the construction of dominant masculinity through clothing. Sean explains, as someone who's multiply marginalized, if we were somehow to take the visibly disabled part of that out of the equation, I wonder to what degree my aesthetic tastes would lean more heavily towards the sanitized versions of desirability, identity, and gender. I think that provocation to think more about where aesthetics play a role in terms of these constructions wouldn't have been as important if I wasn't someone who's visibly disabled, but I am. And I think it's been really generative for me to understand my clothing through that lens. Here, Sean explains, the disability has been an advantage in pushing him, albeit by necessity, to think about clothing and gender beyond narrow masculine norms. As a result of this understanding, Sean intentionally wears clothes that disrupt masculine aesthetics and make his body hypervisible. For Sean, wearing clothes is a political act to claim space in an ableist world, return ableist stares and challenge the stigma associated with disability. Sure, Sean elaborates here. I think in a way fashion is reclaiming the space that I feel sometimes isn't made for disabled folks out in the larger world. They're oftentimes in isolation and oftentimes they're subject to a lot of stares. For me, reclaiming this space is using fashion as a way to own those stares, to find a joyous way to reclaim how I'm seen and choosing to be seen rather than having that forced on me. Sean is drawn to clothing with both colors and asymmetrical silhouettes because these pieces amplify the asymmetry of his body. For example, he'll wear clothes with bold patterns because the curls and curves of his back create interesting shapes when he wears these pieces. Sean is very intentional here. He does misfit masculinities by using his dress body to challenge patriarchal and ableist society that dictates to disabled people and especially masculine disabled people must cover up their bodies. But this practice of using clothing as queer politics isn't ever easy or simple. Sean gives the example of taking the subway. He's mindful of being a target of harassment as a person of color, a queer person, a person who's visibly disabled, and a man who dresses in norm-defined clothes. Sean deliberately uses clothing to resist the stereotype of disability as helpless, but he still often experiences ableist paternalism and charity 
from non-disabled people. As Sean notes here, sometimes being visibly disabled means folks will give up their seat for you. When you need a seat, being visibly disabled, I think is helpful because you can perhaps ask for a seat in a way that someone who may be invisibly disabled will have a tougher time negotiating. But on the other side, you're constantly visible. People are constantly giving up their seat for you. People are constantly making sure you're okay. And I think dressing boldly is a way to try to mitigate some of that. I don't want people to be charitable all of the time. Here, Sean uses clothing to claim space in the world. Yet he's also grappling with ableism, racism, and homophobia as he amplifies his hypervisibility. So all of the stories I've shared today lead us to the following question. What are the consequences of misfit masculinities on transforming hegemonic masculinity? I think it would be unrealistic to claim that misfit masculinities change hegemonic masculinities in society at large. But I do think that these practices work to create, affirm, and sustain spaces where intersectional disabled, deaf, and mad masculinities can survive and thrive on their own terms. To the extent to which these misfit masculinities move between surviving and thriving is based on participants' unique intersections of disabled embodiments and other social identities. And a shifting relations of power and oppression are produced by them in different contexts. I think the takeaway here is that surviving and thriving act together, not in opposition. And what's illuminated is how marginalization produces ways of understanding, being and doing with through and with fashion in the dress body that stretches dominant ideas and ideals of masculinity because of the knowledge and wisdom produced from marginalization itself. And I think really, really this is my call to fellow fashion researchers, to folks who are joining here today. As you research with marginalized communities, Consider how you can center this complexity and this contradiction. Consider how joy and wisdom coexist with pain and trauma when marginalized folks engage with fashion. Doing so will move us away from the harm of storing marginalization as only broken. But even more, doing so reveals the brilliance, the creativity and the knowledge that marginalized folks bring to fashion into the world by using dress as politics and resistance. Yet at the same time, it still calls on us and requires structural change in order to advance social justice. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Ben, for this enticing talk and for sharing this um, highly original and important research with us. You can now use, you can now use um, the chat to ask questions or raise your hand to ask questions to, um, to Ben directly. I will start. He's my privilege of the open microphone and ask the first question. I'm really interested in the gender distinction in your research. In a way, why why the focus on masculinity? And something that struck me when you started talking is is um, John Burge's predicament, which he formulated exactly fifty years ago, that men act and women appear. And something that you said um, in relation to that, you said especially masculine disabled people must uh, cover their bodies. So I'm I'm wondering. First of all, why the gender distinction and then how you see, in a way, um, that logic of John Barger, is that still applying? If so, does would that not mean that women would have to cover themselves even more? Are men possibly now forced to act and appear? And um, yeah, the consequences of that. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think it's a great, like, great question. Why the focus on masculinity? Um, and I think on one hand, this project emerged from research I did before on a project called Refashioning Masculinity that looked broadly at really men, masculinity, and fashion in that relationship. 
in the contemporary North American context. And from that, um, there was a focus on looking at intersectional experiences. And we had a few participants in that project who were disability identified. And in reading through kind of the literature that existed around disability and masculinity, um, I saw how limited that research was, but how narrow it was, that so much focused on the experiences primarily of white cisgender men who use wheelchairs. Um, and the dominant narrative was that they uphold traditional notions, dominant notions of masculinity um, to survive and to navigate the world. Um, and I think in sort of thinking that, I really wanted to build on the work I did before and also expand that narrative and expand the work within fashion masculinity um, within that space that really within fashion and masculinity. So, so really limited work looked on the disability experience. Um, and so that was really the focus on masculinity. There had been much more work that looked at on women or female identified folks and their experiences, both the, through the disability experience and also with fashion. Um, and I think part of this research was also to challenge men's fashion research and masculinity studies in general to move beyond just cisgender men by really saying that this is yes, cis and trans men, but also masculine identified um, folks and understanding who is masculine, who performs masculinity and trying to make that as inclusive and as a way to also challenge, um, I think in some ways the very, the still binary restrictions in which gender has been studied both in disability and fashion. Um, I think then when we think of this idea of men acting in the fear, um, I think that so much of disability studies around masculinity um, would say that if men need to follow hegemonic codes that they would cover their bodies, they wouldn't show off their bodies because that would be a sign and a symbol of femininity, particularly for men with physical disabilities whose bodies are already hyper-visible. So there would be added pressure to then um, cover and to then act and recognizing that in some sense are always on display, um, which in some ways, right, kind of crosses over to that idea of femininity and how, well, how do we block that off as much as possible. That would look, that's what that narrative would say. Um, and I think what was important in this research was to expand the voices and stories and bodies that were participating and recognizing that that is not the story for all disabled men or masculine folks, that there's many folks who are actually challenging that um, and so the goal here was to share those stories and explore those stories and how fashion then is used um, in that specific way. Okay, thank you very much. That uh, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. So please, please feel free to open your microphones and um, pose questions to Ben or pose them in the chat if you want. Robert, over to you. Thanks, Renata. And thanks very much, Ben. That was really fascinating, wonderful work. I have found it useful as a way to um, think more about my own work in terms of media studies and how the idea of a misfit um, has been quite generative for me in terms of spaces and, and experiences of media consumption. So this is a nice kind of analog in some ways. So thank you very much. My question, I've got a couple of questions, but I might try to leave space for others. <clears throat> first, but my the one question I'd like to ask first is whether um, uh, wh whether you see the possibilities of overlap between what you're calling dominant or hegemonic masculinities on one hand and on the other misfitting masculinities. I don't think you're arguing for a clear opposition, but I'm wondering what potential there is for overlaps. That's a great question. Thank you. I think, yeah, it'd be very interesting to see how misfitting as a concept is taken up, um, not just within disability studies, but in different spaces and where those overlaps lie. It was really interesting for this project, I have to say, to engage in the field of critical disability studies, which is a field I had not really engaged with before, um, and seeing where fashion is taken up, how it's been taken up, or what concepts actually um, would be really valuable when thinking through the role of fashion in the dress body. And so the misfit was certainly one that I really 
gravitated towards and have been has been have been using as a lens to think to think through this and this project. Um, that's a great question. I think when I think about kind of this relationship between misfit and hegemonic masculinities, are the idea that misfit masculinities are one are a response to hegemonic masculinities as a way to recognizing that if I don't fit in within these dominant ideals and ideas, that um, and by being whether right whether that's it through disability and body difference, whether that's through madness, whether that's through whatever intersecting identities that I automatically will misfit with that. And so either the, the options that happen together versus in binary are ways that I do try to, you know, the folks in the research either deliberately use that, amplify that misfitting as a political act and as a way to create space and as a way to further explore their embodied self in the world through clothing and dress or as a way to say for safety, for protection, for financial security, for whatever, how can I shore up some of that dominant masculinity, recognizing I may never you know, match those ideals, but as a way to survive. So when I sort of at the conclusion talked about the surviving and thriving happening together, I think hegemonic masculinity coexists with misfit, mas mis with misfit masculinities in a way that is both a response, um, but also a way that it can be shored up in particular contexts to the extent possible as a form of protection. Um, and so it's certainly operating in relationship to, it's misfitting in relationship to versus completely transforming it, but recognizing that there's those spaces of transformation resistance within that, within those dominant kind of masculine ideals and ideas. Thank you. Um, can I just quickly follow on by asking whether the reverse direction is also a possibility that's worth exploring of, 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 of those who are in certain contexts or in certain um, circumstances hegemonic or, or achieve a sense of dominance, um, in some ways also misfitting or have moments of misfit or have spaces or circumstances in which in which misfitting is um, their positionality, if you like. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think in my previous research, right, I think the idea of hegemonic masculinity as a analytical tool is that no one ever actually achieves that, right? Yeah. It's these ideas and ideals that folks aspire towards or that society um, enforces for masculine folks or men to aspire towards, but no one ever actually can meet all of those standards. I think what I saw in my past research is the difference is that men who come as close to those ideals have certainly do misfit, but have more privilege to decide when to misfit and when to not. And moreover, to use that misfitting as a way to further shore up privilege and dominance. Um, so I saw, for example, in research I did previously, how men that could easily fit into those ideals could easily also, also chose to misfit deliberately which would come with a social advantage or a benefit. So I think of, for example, in past research, a curator who would dress and use clothing in particular feminized and queer ways, even though that wasn't their identification, as a way to sort of be seen as following ideals of what a curator could look like in particular contexts, but then recognizing when they were meeting with donors from financial institutions or law firms that had different ideas would immediately switch, right? Code switch those clothes to something else, could like switch in a very different way to also fit in easily in those contexts. So, right, it's still, in that way, it's so contextual, but there's a different negotiation and experience and consequence around power that comes from who misfit, who has the ability to misfitting capacity and more agency in misfitting and to do so intentionally. And how does that further either shore up systems of power or not? Thank you very much. I also wanted uh, um, to follow up something that you said about uh, one of your participants, Luke, in connection to safety, dressing for a sense of safety, um, because it follows up a discussion I had with my students in class today about motivations or motives in dressing related to protection and anxiety. And I wonder how you 
you know, what role might that play? Um, because you, you spoke about um, also comfort in a way, social comfort, physical comfort, but in a way the, the opposite or, or more um, sort of negative motives, how do they play in? I think it's really, I mean, I think in many ways bringing the experience of disability and madness into the conversation expands how we start to think about safety and comfort when it comes to dress um, and makes it more complicated, I think, in many ways. I think Luke is a really interesting example because for them, um, there is both physical comfort takes like different forms, right? It's And it's both like, how do I not harm my body by wearing something that's so restrictive that I know is gonna cause me pain? And at the same point, um, how do I move in the world in a way that's not gonna allow me to perhaps put myself at risk of physical violence um, and increase anxiety um, because I'm dressing in ways that are comfortable, that express my identity, but obviously challenge norms of the context I'm in. And you see this like really interesting tension that exists um, between them and seeing how that has to be balanced. And I think for Luke, in many ways, for them, it was a compromise, right? It was like how much, I mean, and I didn't talk about this in talk, but in the interview, so much of them before they worked and just started in academia was, if I'm gonna prioritize my safety at work and my physical safety at work, how much am I, can I go there for three hours? And then can I quickly take a break in my private office and undo the buttons of my pants to let my body breathe and feel comfortable? What is that like negotiation and navigation between like safety from both like a gender perspective, from a disability perspective and the clothing? And so, so much became this negotiation and this navigation of really carefully planning what safety looked like, calculating and balancing between those tensions of physical safety for the body um, as a disabled person and physical safety for them as a queer identified non-binary person. Mm. Thank you. I have more questions, but I'm... <laughs> But I'm holding back because I want to to give others the chance to to ask. Sarah. Hi, thank you, Ben, for um, your talk. It's obviously a very important topic. And obviously knowing that the fashion industry has so many problems, especially when it comes to you know environmental workers' rights and inclusion and disability, it can and diversity can kind of feel like you're screaming into the void sometimes. So how do, I guess like, how do you personally, personally measure um, seeing the fruits of your labor, so to speak, or maybe it's out, maybe it's a sense of personal fulfillment or something that exists outside of academia where there's a moment where you're like, okay, I can see that this work is actually materializing outside of, you know, my research. How do you get by in that sense? That's such a good question. Um, I think, I mean, maybe I've tried have two thoughts and maybe I sort of will think out loud. I mean, I always try to think, I think as like, what are ways that, what are ways that, the, the, like this research, for instance, can, how can I use what I've learned here and what I've learned from stories of participants and bring that into like developing classes, developing, supporting scholarships, um, engaging industry in conversation. And I often think in industry and conversation, the conversations that I'm mindful of like wanting to have and that I have is not people that are doing this, like not necessarily brands that are like, we, provide, you know, we 
are completely, you know, we have accessible clothes, we hire disabled people, we like stare into these voices, like those critical conversations about, okay, what are your chat? Like, why aren't you doing this? What are the challenges you experience from doing this? How can we think through and talk through those? Where does stigma and stereotypes exist in the organization? And how can we have those discussions? So I think so much of like that change is where are the moments that you can bring in the research you're doing into generative conversation in the other spaces you occupy. Um, and sometimes that doesn't look like transformation um, quickly, um, or maybe not even for like how long that kind of relationship or conversation like lasts, but you know that that is making an important intervention in a way that can build towards more change. So I think so much of this is okay, like how can I bring these learnings into the other spaces I occupy um, other than research? And how can that be valuable in moving a conversation forward or doing something intentional or asking a question or making some kind of change? But even, but that is, even if it's opening a conversation, that I think is still, right? That's a, that's starting to rupture the existing system just asking that question. So I think so much is how can, yeah, how can you bring this, like the work you do um, and the research you do outside of maybe that like area of just research community into these other spaces um, that we all occupy in our lives um, to start to foster change. And certainly bringing that into industry by asking key questions is good, even if it's not looking to change. And I think having that, bringing that dialogue and that conversation um, is an important starting point. And so I think for me, that's really what I've tried to do from the learnings of this research. And I think part of, I'll say, what this research has really taught me is that simply having brands like start to make quote, adaptive fashion or more accessible clothing is great, but like, right, the real systemic change is why aren't you hiring more disabled folks as designers? What are the barriers to education for like disabled, deaf and like mad people? How can we prevent those, right? How do we actually create those pathways? How can we work? So it's given me, I think a deeper understanding of some of the systemic issues at play beyond just let's just create more accessible clothes and think and starting to be able to have those deeper conversations that can you know, lead to changing kind of the design of clothes too, but also changing the deeper structures that kind of underpin that. That's, thank you so much. That's a great and thoughtful answer. I agree completely, so thank you. I would love to answer, to ask another question which uh, concerns another negotiation between the visual and the haptic, which strikes me as being part of this, um, yeah, part of this, this research, also in relation to, to research that I've done on the, the role of the mirror in the process of dressing. So I'm wondering what role did the mirror play in what you've observed? there because it's it over directs our understanding of self very much towards the visual yet here the negotiation that you've talked about is very much centered around this negotiation between the visual and the haptic and also maybe a reflection on your own presence as a researcher within these really quite intimate settings of somebody open up their wardrobe talking about their clothing practice in a way your presence as a researcher as a social mirror yourself. That's such a, such a thoughtful question. Um, I mean, I think I'll start with maybe saying one of the things that I appreciate the most about the wardrobe interview method is that by having participants um, simply touch their clothing, like show you a garment and like, like, oh, this is what it is and I love this and touch it, how that immediately opens up to recounting memories, experiences, emotions, conversations that I think without that 
garment being present and particularly without touching that garment would maybe never come to their mind or we could never really be able to access those conversations. So I think when particularly in like more qualitative or in research with people within fashion, and I think as we're understanding the experience of both like making or wearing clothes, there's something very powerful about having the participants who are having interviews and conversations with touch because that then opens up so, so, so much. And I've certainly found that in all of the kind of wardrobe interviews um, I've done and that that's been really important. I think the other thing that I think I would add to that sort of understanding maybe more methodologically is the second phase of the research that we're kind of in right now and I didn't talk about today is this fashion hacking workshop. So all the participants are paired with um, two research assistants or two like a research uh, someone on the team with and then um, a fashion design student who's a research assistant on the project and they're taking a piece of clothing that the participant has but doesn't fit their body um, or doesn't provide access for their body mind doesn't fully express their desired intersectional identities and they're together digitally so lots of mailing um, because of the pandemic remaking that piece of garment collaboratively in a way that makes sense for that kind of pod or team um, to express, run to provide access for their body and mind and also to express their identity. Um, and what I've seen from that is there's also something very powerful about this moment of like ripping apart clothing that no longer works for you or never worked for you, but you have, and then remaking it in bringing other experiences, memories, conversations to the surface. And what's been the most revealing is obviously not just that physical garment, but the process of the conversations that happen in that collaborative making about both experiences of feeling marginalized, experiences of resistance, experiences of affirmation um, in that group. And then what does that open up and how we understand sort of gender, disability, fashion, um, and something that we're like only kind of learning about, I'm learning about now, but that also really centers the role of touch and not just touching a garment you have, but like touching in a way that you're ripping apart and remaking it. Um, and so I think in this way, I'm really interested in these more haptic or tactile and multi-sensory methodologies in fashion um, that in some ways are bringing, that are mixing our different kind of subfields within fashion together as a way to understand the practice, the process, the experience of wearing and embodying clothing. Um, and so I would say that that has been a really critical part. I think the New York sort of idea is very interesting because certainly, especially on Zoom, I feel like it is even more of a mirror as the participants also, right, are in, for many are seeing, for some are seeing themselves. And so I think um, by having then the conversation that is so focused on showing the garment, ripping apart a garment together over Zoom, it almost, it de-emphasizes the role of the mirror or the, or the visual because in the conversations, the role of touch and multi senses is so present um, in the project and what we're doing. And I think the last thing I'll say is as we're even now thinking about the fashion show and the exhibition, we're trying to think about how do we make this experience, right, to share the stories from this project, to share new, to disrupt assumptions around disability and fashion. How do we make sure that that show is also fully accessible? so that people can engage with that in a multi-sensory way. And we've been learning and thinking through what does accessible curation look like? And I think this is part of a way where how do we move access beyond the role of function? So simply, for example, you would have, you could have audio description, describe the garment and actually make access an aesthetic and access deepening the experience of engaging with clothes. So how can we have audience like, uh, guests to the exhibition like touch clothing in really interesting ways um, in ways that allow them to experience it how do we think of audio description not just as functional but as 
portrays. Um, and so what are ways that we can really go beyond the visual um, in communicating and sharing and experiencing fashion. And so taking so much of those learnings from the wardrobe interviews and these hacking workshops, then into the exhibition and the fashion shows that we're planning for next year around the project. Thank you. So the, the outcome in a way of the research project is, is a um, kind of public dissemination. Yeah, so the outcome of the project, I mean, there'll be one of the core kind of outcomes will be a public exhibition um, in April 2023. And probably in that exhibition at some point, we'll also have a complimentary fashion show um, that will feature participants in the project wearing key items from their wardrobe, but also the item that they have. Um, and so some part, and so that as and I think part of that is how can we tell the stories in this in a way to center the participants and in a way that is going to be as multi-sensory and embodied as possible. Um, so that will be sort of the final outcome of the project, in addition to thinking through the more kind of traditional academic kind of modes of sharing this. Thank you. That sounds fascinating. And is it research that you did in Canada? Yeah, so the research began, all the participants are located in Canada, in Toronto and in Edmonton. Um, but now the research has continued. So the participants are based in Canada, but because now I've moved to New York, we have research assistants, many research assistants engaged in the project who are uh, undergraduate and graduate students at Parsons. So now it's become this kind of nice uh, team between like Parsons and um, in Toronto and in Edmonton, um, sort of working together. And I mean, one of the things of the pandemic, it's allowed us to completely redesign every aspect of the project to be digital. Um, when originally this was all gonna be done in person, but we started the project. We received funding just as the pandemic had started. Um, and so this sort of allowed us to completely reconceptualize for the first kind of six months, how we were gonna do this. And in fact, by doing that, um, we noticed it actually just opened up access for folks who may not have been able to participate in the project otherwise. That sounds great. How many people, sort of what was your sample? How many people have you interviewed so far? Or are you planning to? So we have about 60 participants overall um, who've been interviewed and people's sort of you know experiences and like where they're in the world will change i think we'll have about 50 then 50 now who are in fashion hacking workshops and who will then ultimately take part in our fashion show and exhibition um yeah yeah it's it's really brilliant to hear the the extent um of the research uh thank you really very much for sharing this important um, work that you're doing and, and really contextualizing it so well. Um, thank you so much for, for such a rich talk, Ben, and for joining us uh, this evening in Paris. Thank you, thank you so much, much for inv inviting me to share this with all of you um, and for engaging, I really appreciate it.